the last time uh, we looked at uh, spectral norm and uh, uh, some of its uh, and spectral radius um, and some uh, DIUS and some of their properties. And we started discussing about the error in inverses. <clears throat> so today we will continue the discussion about uh, the error in computing matrix inverse inversions. And we'll also talk about the errors in solving systems of linear equations. Um, so just to recap. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we were looking at uh, in a matrix A in C to the N cross N, which is non-singular. And we want to compute A inverse, so A inverse exists. But uh, because of uh, various reasons, we don't end up computing uh, A inverse. Instead, we compute Instead of A inverse, we compute. So your voice is breaking. A plus E inverse. Um, so uh, yeah, I understand if my voice is breaking, but um, uh, I think uh, I'm connected to the IACW LAN. So this is the best connection I can get. So, no, sir, your voice is OK, actually. Maybe you might be. Sir, voice is OK. OK, thanks. Yeah, this is the best network I can get, so I can't really do much more than this. Um, so. <clears throat> yeah, so the last so we were looking at the error. Uh, which is equal to A inverse minus A plus E. Inverse. OK, and. Uh, uh, we wanted to sort of get a feel for how this error, uh, how big this error can be. And uh, we did some algebraic manipulations, which I won't repeat um, again today. You can go back and look at the notes from the previous class. But what we showed is that um, um, if um, the norm of. So let me put it this way. If I look at the spectral radius rho of A in E, this is going to be less than or equal to the norm of, it's in some norm, it doesn't matter which one, so some matrix norm, A inverse E is less than one. Okay, then these infinite summations can be evaluated in closed form. And so we showed that the norm of A inverse minus A plus E inverse can be written as the norm of the summation K equal to one to infinity because the first term drops off because it cancels with this A inverse term minus one power K plus one times a inverse E power K times A inverse. And uh, this by using the <coughs> submultiplicativity property, we split it as the norm of this thing power K times the norm of A inverse. And so we can show that this is equal to actually less than or equal to norm of a inverse E divided by one minus norm of A inverse E times the norm of A inverse. So we said that the relative error which we defined to be norm of A inverse minus A plus E inverse divided by norm of A inverse is less than or equal to 
the norm of A inverse E divided by 1 minus norm of A inverse E if norm of A inverse E is less than 1. Okay, so this gives us a way to bound the relative error in computing the inverse of a matrix in terms of the norm of this matrix A inverse times E. Sir? Yes. Uh, sir, in order to calculate the norm of A inverse E, wouldn't hmm. we need to know A inverse? You would need to know A inverse and E. So as written, it's not very uh, useful. Um, so, um, but, um, so it will be useful if there is some way you can, uh, in some independent manner, obtain a bound on the norm of A inverse E. So, for example, um, you know, we have a row of A inverse E is less than or equal to the norm of A E, which can be further bounded as the norm of A inverse times the norm of E. And suppose this was also norm of A inverse times norm of E was also less than 1. Now, in, in general, you actually don't know A inverse and you don't know the, you don't know E. And so you wouldn't, uh, so, but then if you have some other way of obtaining a bound on the norm of A inverse and the norm of E, then you can find their product and utilize something like this. Yeah, but this is the nature of uh, the results in a lot of the error analysis where um, it gives you a way to bound the error, at least when you know what is the error matrix? So, for example, um, if you are doing quantization of the entries of A, then you do know what uh, the quantization error matrix is. And so, if you knew the correct A matrix and then you know the quantized A matrix, you know the quantized error matrix. The other way these things can be useful is if you know that the error matrix comes from a certain distribution, then you can look at what values this right hand side can take as you take different value, different uh, E matrices from that distribution and use that to obtain some, some kind of bounds on this. So you'll, you'll have to bring in probability on top of this and say, what is, this, what is this bound? Can this bound be shown to be less than something with high probability over all possible E matrices? So you will have to use those kind of techniques to further uh, make these useful. But if this is also less than one, then we can simplify this further. Uh, see, this is the this a in, norm of A inverse times norm E is something that's bigger than this. So if I substitute norm of A inverse times norm E over here, it only makes the numerator big. It only makes the denominator smaller. So it makes this overall ratio actually bigger. And so we have that norm of A inverse minus A plus E inverse divided by norm of A inverse is less than or equal to norm of A inverse times norm of E divided by 1 minus norm of A inverse times norm of E. And I can multiply and divide by norm of A to write this as norm of A inverse times norm of A times norm of E divided by norm of A divided by 1 minus norm of A inverse norm of A times the same thing, norm of E divided by norm of E. So we'll define this quantity here 
to be kappa of a norm of a inverse times norm of a if a is non-singular and infinity if a is singular. <clears throat> so this thing is called the condition number of a. Okay, so if we define it like this, so um, uh, so how many of you have heard of this concept of conditional number? Have any of you heard of it before? So it was discussed in the last tutorial. Ah, very good. Okay, but other than that, in your undergraduate program, has I had any of you heard of the conditional number of a matrix? Uh, something like the ratio of maximum minimum eigenvalues. Correct. Correct. So if you take the spectral norm of the matrix, um, it's the largest uh, magnitude um, eigenvalue of the matrix. And therefore, uh, uh, one other uh, side result is that uh, if, um, if you know the eigenvalues of a matrix, the eigenvalues of the inverse of the matrix um, are the inverses of the eigenvalues of the original matrix. And so uh, this uh, condition number reduces to the ratio of the maximum to the minimum magnitude eigenvalues of that matrix. So yes, so um, yeah, so this is called the condition number. And uh, note that if we consider this uh, condition number k of a, this is for an invertible matrix is the norm of A inverse. So, but the more general definition is valid for any norm. It's specific to the norm. So depending on which norm you choose here, you will get different values for this condition number. And this norm that you're choosing here is the norm under which relative error over here. So the, this is norm of A times the norm of A inverse, which is greater than or equal to the norm of A inverse A. This is just submultiplicativity, which is equal to the norm of the identity matrix. And we know that for any matrix norm, this is greater than or equal to one. So uh, the condition number uh, of uh, for any matrix A is going to be a number which is greater than or equal to one for any matrix norm. And um, further, because it's lower bounded by one, K of A, even though it's mapping uh, a matrix to the real line, can never be a, uh, a matrix norm because uh, uh, k of a equal to zero will never happen and so it will never satisfy this positivity constraint okay so what is the so for in particular if i take the all zero matrix what is its condition number infinite infinity correct so so thus we have this norm of A inverse minus A plus E inverse over norm of A inverse is less than or equal to K of A times, uh, I'll write it like this, one minus K of A times norm E over norm A times norm E over norm E. <clears throat> so from this we can see a lot of interesting properties. So for example, if uh, this number is small, 
then we can neglect this term here. Um, it need not be a lower bound anymore because then you're making this thing smaller, but uh, assuming that this is small enough that neglecting it uh, does not break this upper bound, uh, you have kappa of A times norm E over norm A, which means that this uh, K of A or the condition number of A, it represents the, um, uh, it allows you to bound the relative error in computing the inverse in terms of the relative error in the, in the matrix A itself. Okay. And um, if K of A is close to one, that is, it is small, then we say that the matrix A is a well-conditioned matrix because it only amplifies the norm E over norm A by a small amount when you compute the inverse. Whereas if K of A is a large number, the matrix A is ill-conditioned and or poorly conditioned and it will lead, it can lead to potentially a large increase in the relative error or a large value of the relative error in computing the inverse, even for small perturbation E. So, I'll just mention these uh, keywords that I dropped. Um, small K of A. It's called a well-conditioned matrix. Large K of A. Let's say that it's an ill-conditioned matrix. And uh, for completeness, if K of A equals one, we say that it is a perfectly conditioned matrix. So what is an example of a perfectly conditioned matrix? I, identity. Yes. How about uh, unitary matrices? Are they perfectly conditioned? Yes, sir. It depends on yes, which norm you are using. Right? Um, it depends on which norm you choose to use. Um, for unitary matrices, uh, U transpose or U Hermitian is the same as U inverse. And so it becomes, uh, K of A becomes norm of U, Herm U Hermitian times norm of U. And uh, so depending on which, which norm you are using, they could be perfectly conditioned. So in particular, if you're using the spectral norm, then they will be perfectly conditioned. Okay, so the punchline is that for well-conditioned matrices, the relative error in the inverse is the same as the relative error in the data. Okay. Now, uh, one other property of uh, the um, condition number is that if you take the product of two matrices, this condition number is less than or equal to the product of the two condition numbers. That's simply because the left hand side is norm of AB times the norm of a, B inverse. 
which is less than or equal to, now I just use submultiplicativity, norm of A times norm of B times norm of A inverse times norm of B inverse. Okay. Yeah, so actually there's a lot more one can say about this condition number. Um, I will leave some of them as uh, homework exercises and I'll come back to this later in the course if there is enough time. But uh, right now I don't want to distract ourselves from discussing about um, computational errors. And so let's now discuss about um, bounding the accuracy Uh, sir, yeah. Sir, in the condition number, uh, when will the equality exist in the above uh, inequality? In this one? You mean? Uh, sir, in the K A B is less than K A into K B. Yeah, that's hard to say um, when when it will hold with equality. Yeah, so obviously if A or B is the identity matrix, uh, it will hold with equality, but uh, uh, for, I mean, it's not, not easy to come up with uh, very general conditions under which uh, equality will hold. It depends on the norm also, so not easy. I mean, there's no straightforward answer to that question. Uh, sir, uh, even if A and B are I, the equality will hold uh, uh, even only when the norm considered is the operator norm, right? Correct. Okay, okay. thanks. Sir. 